Discord has quickly risen to be the number one most used social media app for gamers and internet communities in the world. Back in the day, there was Skype, and before that, something probably even less memorable. But now, Discord is where it's at. The biggest communication platform save for maybe only Facebook Messenger. And with that comes a lot of benefits, but also unforeseen dangers. good to go. I've been recording in this studio with this background since probably when I was still a teenager. But today is most likely going to be the day that we use this studio to record probably the most disturbing video I've ever made. That's saying something. In light of my recent scam baiting video involving Discord, someone of this channel's longtime supporters decided to reach out and share this personal experience that only recently unfolded. Today, we're going over the single click that almost costs a Discord user their life, and the rather insane rabbit hole that it led to. You know what day it is, alright? Uh, I hope that you have a nice batch of marshmallows or Halloween candy or whatever you eat on this day in order to relax and watch this video because it's going to be a long one, but it's also going to be a good one. This experience has been shared with me and involves real life events that I've altered the specifics of in certain cases just for the sake of privacy reasons, but in general, the message that this individual named James sent contains a ridiculous amount of detail, so much so that I've had to condense it for the sake of this video not being as long as a feature length film. But links can sometimes be dangerous. If you've watched videos on this channel, then that shouldn't be new information to you. But how bad can one click be? James was a software engineer by trade, and still is, but also an avid gamer, Discord user, and parent. Now James is not too young of a lad, and has definitely a well-paying job, living with his wife and seven-year-old daughter in, of all places, New Jersey. Now he has this Discord server where some of his friends hang out and play online regularly almost every day, and he's got a lot of friends in there. Whenever James is home from work, he generally is online whenever there's enough free time. So this one day after playing a session, James gets a friend request on Steam. He notices the user's profile, and it's not that he recognizes them or knows them by name, but does get a sense of familiarity with their picture. It's actually a girl he remembers from a long time ago in high school, and they have a really active Steam account with dozens of games recently played one of which being the one he was just in. Apparently, it was actually them because they had a bunch of their social media links attached. Accepting the friend request, he immediately started typing and confirmed with them that they were indeed his friend from long ago, whom he had a crush on at one point. James refers to them as Carrie. So they talked through Steam messages for some time. It's been nearly 10 years since he's even heard anything of them, and they're just catching up as anyone would. Hello, is this Jim? It is. Sorry, I just saw your request. You didn't happen to go to Manchester High? I did. It's Carrie. By chance, I found your profile on here. It's been so long. You're a gamer too, I take it. It has. That's so crazy. And yes, I am. Not full time but I'm working on it. What have you been doing all this time? Eventually, they gave James their Discord handle, suggesting they stay in contact. So there's not much more to it. He adds them on Discord as friends, 
and they talk periodically from time to time. Eventually, he even adds them to the personal server. And this is just someone who he long long ago had a crush on. And they were actually one of the most popular people in his school. But being all grown up, with a family of his own now, of course the conversations with this person were mundane and cordial. But one day, Carrie decided to send him her Instagram profile casually that interestingly wasn't linked to their Discord account. So he's interested in seeing what this girl has been doing all this time, so he goes ahead and clicks the Instagram link. Well, he's messaging through Discord app on his phone, but when he clicks the link, it doesn't go straight to Instagram, it opens up a Safari page which goes to Discord and asks for him to log into his Discord account. Which is a little bit odd, but without thinking much of it, logging into the account through the page, and then it redirects again to Instagram, to a private Instagram account. It is indeed her, quite popular, and all the same username in their bio. So he requests to follow and almost instantly gets approved. And they have tons of posts that go back years, and James is actually pretty impressed on how far they've gotten in life. It's looking like after all this time, he finally managed to talk to the one crush he basically ever had. But obviously, they just stay in touch as friends, talking through Discord and even joining their game sessions, never actually playing with them or speaking, but just being in the group call, and James carries on with his life as usual. He only starts to become a little perturbed when Carrie's messages become really centered around James's daughter. And James specifically allowed me to use his daughter's name, Vinny. And Carrie would always bring up Vinny to a degree that was a little bit unnatural. He had only brought up the fact that he had a daughter to this person once, not long after they had first reached out to him, and only while casually discussing what's changed in their lives over 10 years. Carrie apparently wanted to know everything about them, despite themselves having a quite affluent life evident of their own social media posts, of which they hardly ever spoke about. It would only become really apparent that something was off when James decided to make up some random event that never actually happened at their school, including made up people, and brought it up to Carrie as though it was common knowledge, and they adamantly agreed. James kind of didn't think too much of it because it could have been possible that Carrie was just being a little bit eccentric and pretending to make up a memory of something that she didn't remember in order to just be nice like we all do, being socially inept, or at least maybe that's just me. Weeks went by, the situation became ever more unusual to James. Almost every day, Carrie would message routinely, asking about Vinny. How was Vinny's day at school? Does she do well? Does Vinny have lots of friends? I wish I didn't move away. It's so tiring always having to travel for work, YK. Have you taken Vinny with you on any cool vacations? Yeah, road trip around Florida. Stopped at every Disney park on the way. Wallet regrets it. Jealous NGL. Did you take any cool videos or pics? To be honest, I don't even remember. Only once did James ever send them a family picture with his daughter. And after this, they would only ask more frequently about them. James would try to inquire of something in their life, but the only answers he'd get would be short, dry, and forced, until the conversation inevitably ended up being about his daughter again. He also noticed that their Instagram profile had been fairly active in the past, uploading once every couple of days but it had been two weeks since their last picture. But again, he didn't spend too much time thinking about it. And one day, his wife happened to approach him about the messages, having noticed several of them on his phone screen accidentally. James explained and showed her all of them, verifying that they were only from an old friend from high school and nothing more. But his wife was far less happy about it, especially pointing out how she didn't understand or like how much they were bringing up their daughter. So much so that James wouldn't be able to respond in time before they would message again about something else related to Vinny. James's wife requested that he'd stop talking with them altogether, 
and at this point, he more or less agreed. So we did so. Assumably, Carrie didn't really appreciate this development too much because right after that, they unfriended James on Discord, left James's personal server, and blocked his accounts. Definitely confounding James. Usually, it's the other way around when it comes to me. Like, that, they do that when I first start talking to them. Like, if I, you know, if I slide into anyone's DMs. After that, he would only occasionally check in on their Instagram page out of curiosity. In the rare times, it would cross his mind due to boredom or procrastination. But the profile still didn't post anything new. He scrolled all the way down one day to the very first posts, finding that they were from way back during high school, posted as far back as 2012, and even including people he remembered. This, of course, verified it was actually her, which only made James regret apparently having caused her to block him even more. It would be at this point that James stopped receiving mail altogether. He only noticed this when his mailbox remained empty for over a month. This was very abnormal, as before the inbox would be regularly filled with typical everyday amounts of bills and important notices, and of course, his online deliveries. But even those began to not show up. Even when checking the status of online orders for important things such as appliances, food, and other things, the site would always confirm they were successfully delivered. After about a month of this, he decided to take a deeper look into it. After multiple calls to customer service resulted in dead ends, James checked his accounts and finds that almost all of them have had their address changed. His bank account has multiple unpaid bill notices, and his address on there has also been changed. He looks through every online account, and each one now has his address listed as some house located multiple blocks away in the relatively unsafe part of town. He looks it up online, and it turns out that it's a recently foreclosed property with no one living in it. The issue even affected his credit score because of the several missed bills. All of his and his wife's automatic payments were discontinued from their bank. Frustratingly, he manually changes all of his accounts back again to his actual address and looked through his recent emails to see if there had been any unusual activity with any of them, but of course, found nothing awry. So finally, the mail starts coming in again and everything returns to normal. So a couple of days later, he's checking the box to clear out the normal amount of letters, bills, and Amazon packages and finds one envelope that has his daughter's name written on it. James opens it right on the spot and finds that it's a single lined paper filled with paragraphs of cursive writing that he can't read, but it's clearly handwritten. Most of what he interprets of it is stuff like help you and grandma written many times. He couldn't understand the rest of the message, but it was clearly handwritten and in an old-fashioned format, but oddly addressed to not him or anyone he knew living there, but other than his daughter. Predictably, this unnerves James, but he doesn't show it to his wife or anyone else. The paper wasn't signed or labeled with any address, so he just throws it away along with all the other junk letters. And the next night after he got home from working, and long after dinner, James was playing online again, when he was hit with a rather sudden development of fatigue and brain fog. So he logged off for the night and went to bed. But sleeping that night was completely out of the question, as James recounted going in and out of lucidity, suffering through an immense migraine, and even hearing auditory hallucinations. He remembered hearing laughing from the walls all around him, which sounded like his daughter's laugh, and also vaguely remembered hearing the sounds of Vinny's toys that had sound chips within them. But every time he would fully wake himself, they would be gone. This would persist for many nights. According to his wife, he would yell out his daughter's name angrily, shouting to keep it down in the middle of the night. One of these occasions actually waking Vinny 
Now, they live in a rather sizable townhouse-style apartment, and the way their room is set up is that James has their room, and it's connected sort of with Vinny's room through a large closet which separates them, and it's accessible from both rooms. And it forms kind of like this hallway, which I described based off of the way he's told me in this visualization. And this is what makes the situation unsettling, because James assumably heard bizarre sounds of his daughter's toy dolls activating in and out of his sleepless condition, sometimes mixing in with his dreams where he would hear some electronic doll voice speaking to him within his weird unconscious state, only for him to wake up and almost surely keep hearing it for a second or two before stopping, always quiet and muffled as though it were coming from the wall behind him. So James knows at this point that Vinny must be playing with her toys late at night secretly when she's supposed to be asleep, and he's fed up and angry due to his grogginess, so he gets up and storms over to Vinny's room, but Vinny's fast asleep. So at this point James decides, you know what, I'm gonna go to the doctor, finally, because I'm feeling like I might have a very serious sudden medical condition. His symptoms all seem to weirdly disappear every single morning, like as if nothing had even happened. Just kind of like a temporary, almost uh, inebriation sort of thing. So there's not really any other symptoms he could report to the doctor, so he, he, he can't get an answer to it. But then he starts to develop the symptoms throughout the day, and they start getting severe enough that they in impact his regular life. So over a couple of days, he stays at home and does all the chores around the house himself, preparing his own food, cleaning, and lounging around to rest. And he recovers almost instantly as though he was never even sick. So the next week, it's Vinny's birthday, and he decides that for that he's going to take her to the favorite to their favorite drive through restaurant and he drives through and orders everything that Vinny wants and also all the stuff that he wants for himself but when he gets to the window of the drive through the person working there says okay we, we got your order for you but the person in front of you has already paid for your meal so you don't have to worry about paying just a nice good deed sometimes that happens to you, I guess. But then they also said, hold on one second, we have something for you that the car in front of you wanted you to have. So they hand them the letter along with their order. And also the person at the window was kind of elderly, it took a long time for them to get their order. But when they did, they handed them this letter. They handed James a letter saying, well, it came from the car ahead of you. So James takes it, and they leave. And he looks down at the envelope, and to his dismay, it's again Vinny's name written on it in handwriting. And James pretends to be unfazed, as he doesn't want to ruin his daughter's happiness over the situation, but this time, he does end up showing the envelope to his wife. And again, multiple paragraphs of cursive as though a young child was going to be able to understand it. James can hardly interpret it, but his wife can much better. She gets extremely distraught, as the letter apparently says that someone is sorry to Vinny, that she must be away from her true family, and that this someone is apparently Grandma, and says that she enjoys playing with her, and hopes she does too. And the note closes by saying happy birthday to Vinny, promising that they will get her back. And of course, James' wife demands to know where the letter came from, but obviously he doesn't know either. He hadn't gotten a look at the car in front of him at the drive through and bizarrely this person goes by Grandma. Vinny's only living grandparents are James's parents, who live in a whole different state. His wife urges him to inform the police, but James takes it upon himself to try to control the situation explaining that there is nothing that they can do about a harmless letter, and that, in the meantime, they shouldn't worry about it. So, James, once again, threw the letter out. That night, he was hit with the slow onset of the same condition yet again, starting with the lightheadedness right before bed, 
This would once more persist for multiple days, causing James to become sluggish at work and borderline catatonic at night. Halloween went by, and James had to stay home for the night because he was too drowsy. So James's wife decides to take Vinny trick-or-treating instead. That night, he unexpectedly got a DM from Carrie's Instagram account. He had almost forgotten about them at this point, but he pulls up the message and it reads, that I'm sorry for blocking you. I was far too invasive. We don't have to hang out anymore, but I just wanted to say that. And James replies, saying he's been receiving messages intended for his daughter and asking if it's them sending it. They immediately deny it, saying that they don't know anything about Vinny. But there's something about how they phrase the message that doesn't sit well with James. I'm going to ask bluntly, can you please be honest? Have you been sending me those letters? What do you mean? Okay, seriously, the several unsigned envelopes. Someone we don't know is handwriting letters to us just starting recently. They're addressed to my daughter. I honestly don't know. Yeah, you blocked me over it. Can you tell me the truth? I shouldn't have blocked you. Was emotional? Sorry. Just stop with the letters. I never sent you any letters, James. I don't know anything about Vinny. He stops messaging them, noticing their profile hasn't posted anything new all this time. He goes to bed early that night, and the sickness is really hitting him hard this time. Now he feels nauseous and delirious. But in the middle of the night, he starts hearing things in between dreams again. This time he knows it's the sound of Vinny's laugh. He wakes up half asleep and nearly canatonic again, and he definitely hears his daughter's muffled soft laughing from the wall. But he's so out of it and fatigued that he's unable to even get out of bed to check on her. So the next morning, James has to call in sick again because every aspect of him feels as though he had the worst hangover in his life. Of course, not having any drinks the night before. So, he hazily walks around the apartment that day, still not feeling right in the head, significant brain fog and fatigue. James particularly described it as feeling that he hadn't slept in a week, but still being unable to close his eyes and sleep. At some point, he goes into his daughter's room and finds some unopened candy on the top of the drawer. Now, James assumes Vinny had already had all the candy from Halloween, so he goes over and looks at them. And they're in these wrapped chocolate pieces, of which brand he's never seen before. So, he sees a lot of them are opened, and also there's just empty, like, wrappers that are just sitting right there on the desk. He later on asks Vinny, you know, where did this candy come from? And Vinny, uh, said, Grandma gave them to me. Vinny's casual statement like that in such a usual childlike way took James aback. He asks her, who is grandma? Vinny says that grandma always gives me sweets and plays with me. But James asks Vinny more, but she doesn't seem to be too responsive about it. James also states here that around this time, Vinny would often seem more detached and spaced out on a regular basis. James' wife was also informed one day by one of her teachers at elementary school that she seemed to be in a daze during class, inattentive, less productive, resulting in lower marks on her report card. This only escalated until one day, Vinny didn't return home from school. The bus just did not even show up. Now, their school is a specific kind of charter school that has a bus system dropping the kids off at their specific houses. And on this particular day, uh, James's wife happened to be home, but she never saw the bus go by and drop off Vinny. It just never showed up. So James only found out about this from his wife calling him frantically while he was at work because Vinny was nowhere to be found, never showed up back from school. So James rushes home and his wife is completely desperate. 
She already called the school and apparently the school said that either James or his wife had changed their address on file to a new one due to recently moving. So the bus route changed to drop Vinny off there. Obviously neither of them had done that. And James is irate at this point, fervently exclaiming to the principal that they did not move and demanding to know the changed address. The principal gives it to them and this time the wife does call the police but James decides to drive to the place himself. It's the same address all of his accounts were changed to previously. James drives all the way through the night to this house, but on the way there, he finds Vinny walking by herself just down the sidewalk. So he spots her, drives up and runs to her and asks her where she's been. Why didn't you show up from school? She hardly even reacts to James as if she's been drugged. Now James brings Vinny back into his car and drives her back home. And he asks, where has she been? Where have you been? And Vinny says, I've been at grandma's house. So at this point, James is livid because of the situation. When he gets home, there's already police that are at his door. There's a patrol car that's parked outside of his house. His wife has already called the police and she's just completely distraught but then she's elated when James comes back. So James tells the police about the whole grandma thing and says that he thinks that she's been drugged or even worse, and also gives the police the address that has been linked to everything happening. And the police say that they're gonna go there and in their own words, see what's going on. James said that's exactly what they said. Well, James doesn't hear back from them until the next day. So they get called by the police saying that the house was foreclosed and empty. They even reached out to the owner and said that no one had even been at the property for at least a month. Obviously, other than this, they changed back their address in the school directory and James took it upon himself to update all of his account passwords and two-factor security. After this, nothing happened for the next couple of days until one night, James woke up to a sound he couldn't quite identify. But by the time he was fully conscious, it was silent. That night, he was fully lucid, not affected by the strange condition. So, he knew that he heard something that had leaked into his nocturnal mind and woke him up. He sits up in bed, and the first thing he sees is the closet light slipping under the door. So he gets up to turn it off, and as he gets to the handle, he stops. For no real reason, he simply stops himself for a second to assess, and his barely awake brain only then questions if he even left the closet light on. He goes in and sleepily makes his way over to the switch, which is on his daughter's side of the closet hall, so to speak. Then he sees Vinny's door wide open. James peeks into his daughter's room but can't see much because his eyes are adjusted to the light. So he searches for the light switch groggily, and on the other side of a bunch of hung-up clothes, to his horror, he sees someone's legs standing still, hardly visible behind everything. In a single second, James feels so much fear that he feels like he's going to pass out. He keeps it together, and somehow, in the moment, manages to pretend he doesn't notice and casually walks out of the closet and into Vinny's room, closing the door. He then wakes up his daughter and carries her out of the room, and then wakes up his wife, getting them to leave the house, and he has enough panic in his voice to get them to go. James tells his wife and they drive straight to the police station. They get there and tell the police everything. The police go to their house and investigate, while James and family stay there overnight. Of course, the police found nobody there. Of course, James at this point was understandably adamant about the situation, and he refused to let his family go back to his house until something was done about this. But the police said that there was nothing that they can do. But he has a Tesla, and he remembered that Teslas record everything, and he just happened to have the Tesla, which also records front and back all the time. So he remembered the drive through incident, and he thinks that he could go and get the footage of the back of that car that was in front of them. 
so he looks through all the saved camera footage from his car going all the way back to that day and finds the dash cam view of the restaurant drive through with the vehicle in front of him. From that, he was able to get the license plate number and give that information to the police station. Reluctantly, James and family return home with the assurance that it was searched and they even assign a temporary squad car outside to monitor the building. James had that day off, but his daughter went to school as usual, and his wife also went to her work. It was when he was alone at the townhouse, with the full wakeful state of mind and the security of police being nearby, that he had it in him to investigate Vinny's room again, and their closet. In there, he of course found nothing, but in his daughter's room, there were more of the same unopened candy pieces on the floor. He looks through the closet, set on finding anything, half expecting to uncover a hidden room, but there is nothing but Vinny's toys and a copious amount of clothes. So for the rest of the day, he tried to calm his own nerves and not think about it too much. And at one point, he just went and grabbed a bottle of water from his kitchen. But then he noticed that something was off about it. That when he opened it, the cap was tight as it should be, but there was no traditional click that you should hear when you open a water bottle for the first time. So he grabbed another one instead, tried it again, same thing. Cap was on, but no click. So he tried it with another one. Every single bottle, every single bottle of water that was in his kitchen had already had their seals broken. And they just had their cap on. That's it. So, obviously because of this, he decides to not drink any of the water, but instead thoroughly search the rest of his kitchen for any more abnormalities. But the only thing that he doesn't find is stuff that's supposed to be there, like food and snacks that are missing. But he knows that a whole lot of stuff has been taken from his kitchen. James informed his wife about what he found and they both decided to set up security cameras inside the house. But from this point, nothing much happened. They noticed no unusual activity, and the police eventually stopped parking outside of their building. Weeks went by, and eventually, James got a call from the sheriff saying they had arrested the vehicle owner with the license plate he had identified. The person who was driving it had been pulled over during a traffic stop and then subsequently brought in for questioning after the police found a trunk to be full of non-prescribed empty cough medicine bottles and a pistol in the back seat. The man evidently revealed everything. He and his wife were living in the foreclosed house, illegally. He also had recently picked up a job at the local McDonald's only a month prior. And when James was brought in to see the man's mugshot, he instantly recognized him as the same old guy from the drive through His wife had apparently been obsessed with James' daughter and forced the man to assist her in getting back her granddaughter. The police went to the foreclosed house and also apprehended the wife, who was drugged up and apparently living in the walls. While the husband smuggled cough syrup that this woman used to inject into candy. James was also told by the police that the husband admitted to compromising his account and having been the one running the fake Discord and Steam profiles. Apparently, the man was also an ex-IT professional before being convicted of several crimes, but he claimed his wife was behind everything else. Well, James never saw the woman who was apprehended, but he technically did end up seeing them. However, the police were able to ascertain that the immense amount of cough medicine that was found in uh, the trunk of the vehicle was used to poison the food and the water in James's house. Also, the candy that this person was apparently giving to Vinny was full of this cough syrup which was like an industrial level of cough medicine. Not anything normal, but something that you have in a syringe. Also while sneaking into their apartment at night. 
Well, this became a big enough deal that James's mom actually found out about the whole thing. Eventually, he would be told by her over the phone that his entire childhood, he was apparently periodically stalked by some unhinged person that his parents never told him about. James's mom told him that when he was a kid, one day, they were going through a drive through They had a note given to them by the cashier saying it was from the car ahead, but this note was addressed to them. It told them in plain writing that James was my child and you stole him from me, and in no uncertain terms accused the parents of being imposters, threatening to take him back. James had never been aware of this. His parents had covered it up for his sake. But many times after that, more incidents would happen, eventually stopping only after James graduated high school and moved away soon after. Apparently, inside the unoccupied house, there were dozens of pictures found taken by someone in a dark room. Lots of pictures of Vinny while at school, and even a picture of James sleeping, printed out in pages, all piled up. Apparently, the original Instagram account that was involved in reaching out to James was also the subject of hijacking, as, of course, his old crush from high school didn't actually message him, but the account had apparently been compromised for months without being recovered. Whoever was running it clearly kept convincing Instagram support that they were the owner because the only photo that was ever posted to the account during this time was one that James found only after all of this had taken place while checking the account again. He saw something that would never leave him for the rest of his life. It was a picture of his daughter's room being taken as a selfie with half the frame being Vinny fast asleep and the other half The account was, of course, recovered by its actual owner, the real Carrie. And then this content on it was removed. But before it was, it had received over 100 likes and also a lot of creeped out, unnerved, and confused commenters. But the message of the post was simply with her family. Shortly after these events, James, Vinny, and his wife would move away from New Jersey. A good decision, and until now, lived without any other hitch. This happened only a year ago. The actual police report of the events say that the suspects in question are apprehended in Sussex County Jail, but there's no more information since then. There hasn't been an official update, and other than this image, there's no other pictures I could find. Obviously, James never accepted another friend request from an old friend from school. Now, obviously, when it comes to the specifics of the story, it's just one person's testimony and also just a couple of backup sources like police report and some information regarding that. I can't really claim to know how this particular hack works, I'd have to not be a primary source or a secondary source, but a third dairy source, because I'd have to go off of what James said this old guy said. I can only assume that it was all surrounding this original link that was going to this Discord login page. Chances are it all stemmed from there. When he types in that information into those fields, his browser asked him if he wanted to save it, and he said yes. And from that point, only we can guess what kind of things took place, what kind of exploits were used, but it's pretty apparent that the information stored in the browser or something was able to be compromised, util utilized, and weaponized against James. But of course, that's just a theory. And in reality, at the end of the story, the only thing that is the most important is that James family ended up being perfectly fine. And the aspect of him having been in the same position as a kid, going through the McDonald's drive through and having someone pay for your meal and then deliver you some message and then having the same thing happen 
all those years later, that is just what really breaks the fifth wall of this story. If his mother was really being truthful about that, which there's no reason why they wouldn't, I guess, um, that just blows my mind in proportions that I can't even comprehend. And I know for you, like, since it's Halloween, you're going to go out and do trick-or-treating. Because you're a little kid, and I know you are. And even if you have your own, like, child, you're probably going to go and do that trick-or-treating. Just be wary. That's all I'm going to say. Because there's some weirdos out there. And if someone's named Carrie, do not accept their friend request. I can literally imagine this whole thing being an episode of the game Fears to Fathom. Literally, I want to play that in real life. Because I'm going to have to change my diaper after recording this anyway, so... Might as well just use the rest of its mileage. Now, James told me that he never has um, revealed the story to anyone else outside of his family. So he just basically gave me the summarized version of all this. This is just uh, leaving out all the sensitive details. So yeah, this whole thing was pretty much just the condensed version. This is the condensed version. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's the end of this episode of Scammer Unsolved. Um, I hope you have a spooky day. If you're watching this after Halloween, you probably are. Have a spooky day anyway. And just remember to uh, be vigilant and safe. I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.